I'm Ted Meyer in Los Angeles, California, and I'm with Olivia Lewis. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit what's happened to you? You've had a pretty amazing story. I collapsed essentially one night and I was rushed to the ER, was unable to move, unable to speak. And I say essentially because I was, there was a part of me that was still in there. I could still think freely, but I, from the outside, I looked like I was unconscious. I was not able to answer questions. I was not able to follow direction. I was diagnosed at the hospital with a brainstem stroke. I had my upper brain function. So I was able to think freely. I was not able to tell my body how to move. I was not able to do any task on my own. I was completely dependent, but every step of the way, I was able to fully think through all of that. So, you know, if someone was helping me use the bathroom, I might have not looked like I was there at all, but I was fully thinking through every single step they went through. When friends and family would come see me, I assume I looked like I was in a vegetative state or I was in a coma. Um, I was not there physically, but from the inside looking out, I was, you know, calling for help. There was a, there was a huge discussion with the surgeons and my family because they were at the place where they were like, she's too far gone. And um, my family would not take no for an answer and they wanted to do something. They wanted to do some intervention. Um, they could not see me as a 21 year old, just lie there. I was diagnosed with locked in syndrome. And that is literally how it sounds. I was locked in my own body. I felt like I was buried alive. And it was excruciating for everyone to watch because at that point, everyone knew that what my condition was. They knew that I was thinking through everything. They knew that I was able to communicate, but I could not physically or verbally speak. You know, I was not able to make facial expressions. I wasn't able to give anyone a look. I I just looked like I was a I was a ghost. You first wake up and realize, okay, I can't move. So what is the process in your head? Are you thinking, well, maybe I can blink and communicate? Or it just seems like sheer terror to me, the thought that, that sitting there going, oh, this could be the next 20 or 30 years for me. I was in so much shock that I, I did not, it did not even, I did not even think about how I could communicate with people. I realized I couldn't speak. My family, what were they were amazing and they were able to do their own research. So they figured out how to communicate with me early on and they um, created a letter board. So they would point at the letters and that's when they said, try to blink. And at this point I could only move my eyes vertically. So, um, I had, you know, I looked up for yes and no for down, but then we did get to a point where I could blink on individual letters and form together a sentence. You're on your own, you're 21, and all of a sudden you are completely dependent on your parents and you can't even really tell them what you want. So it's just a matter of hoping they guess what you need. Right. I mean, they um, got really good at kind of figuring out what I needed and what I wanted. I mean, there nine out of 10 times I would have thoughts that I wanted to express, but I knew that it would take so much time to get them out in the world that I just would sit on them. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't spell them out. I, you know, I wouldn't, I would just think about what I wanted to say because I um, did not feel like wasting my time or anyone else's and you can imagine I was completely frustrated over everything. So 
if I could avoid having a frustrating session where I wanted to spell out what I was feeling, I avoided it. So I, I, I spent a lot of time just kind of silent. How long till you were able to get some verbal ability back? I started making sounds about a year out, maybe a little earlier than a year out. So speech came the la like came the very end of my recovery. So I was walking before I could speak. Writing out or speaking, none of that was a word finding issue. I worked with my OT in therapy where he actually connected a sling device to the ceiling of the hospital room. And I would put my hand in the sling, my limp hand, and I was able to just get enough finger motion to tap on my phone screen so that I could write out on my notes what I wanted. And that was amazing because I didn't need anyone else there to hold up a letter board for me to talk. I was able to say what I wanted in that moment in real time. So that was a huge accomplishment for me. It was a very slow process. I mean, I had to literally go finger by finger, toe by toe, until I got to the point where I was, you know, rolling a manual wheelchair and even rolling the wheels. That was a whole skill I had to learn. Um, then I went to using a walker and then I moved to a cane and then crutches and then walking without a device. You, you were in college, you had big goals and then your life gets to be about tiny goals, like every day making that much progress. Did you get the joy of being able to do that that you got from finishing a class in college or a long-term goal? This has been a topic that me and my family have talked about often lately. Um, we wish that we would have celebrated the tiny moments more because everyone around me did want to celebrate those moments. But I was so focused, laser focused on my end goal of being this version of my old self again, that I didn't care if I moved my hand and even though, or moved my pinky, even though objectively now I look back and I'm like, well, the only way I could get to that point was if I made those smaller movements. But I was not happy until, I, I was not gonna be happy until I met my goal. So even though I would make progress almost every day, it was very small progress, but I would make progress. I never really gave myself any praise or any pat on the back. I was really, really hard on myself. We always hear about people that have been through a heart attack or something and they go, the flowers are more colorful. The, everything smells sweeter. Are you, do you have that sort of sense of, wow, I made it through and now I appreciate it all more before? I think that I definitely have a, a greater understanding of how important life is. Now that you've been through this, what do you want to do with your remaining time? I um, am in the process of writing a book about my experience. I also have dabbled with the idea of starting my own foundation that involves young stroke survivors and young locked-in syndrome survivors and people that are still dealing with locked-in syndrome. I have been doing a lot of speaking to hospitals I actually am speaking to one of the hospitals that I was in three years ago in May. So that will be to all the healthcare providers. So that will be, I think, exciting for everyone involved. I'm just curious about the first time your mom came in and you could look up and she didn't know what was going on with you. She saw a person who had this stroke and you're totally aware of your situation that you're thinking inside, but your mom has no idea about that. So, or your both your parents. So what was it, 
what were your thoughts about them and your concern for your parents looking at you? I kept thinking they're going to pull the plug. Like they don't know that I'm, and no one was even, I don't think talking about that. I just think I had that thought, like no one knows I'm in here. So they're, I'm, they're going to pull the plug eventually after about a day. I think they did, were, were able to figure out that I was cognitively intact. I just had that gut feeling like something really bad is about to happen if I don't let someone know that I'm here. And I don't think that anyone was ever going to pull the plug, but that definitely was just my first instinct. And I feel like would be most people's instinct is like, I'm here, hello. Looking at your parents and thinking, you must have been worried about their concern for you, the stress it put on them. That didn't really come until after I was out of the ICU or I was out of the first few days because initially I was so drugged up. I wasn't really, I was so in shock. I was so confused on what was happening. But when I started to go to the other hospital, I was transferred to another hospital. And when I was there, I started to really think about how horrible this is for everyone involved. And I would just witness, you know, my mom crying or my family in the hallway speaking with the doctor. And I think I just realized there was so much that was weighing on everyone. And even though I was physically impacted, the whole family was just torn apart. It's just an amazing story. I mean, I just, your strength and the fact that now you're going out and you're helping people and you're writing a book and you're going back to hospitals to help people. It's, it's amazing. So I, I just want to thank you for talking to me and just, you, you. like I said, you've been through something that so the thought of it so terrified me and I'm looking at you smiling and you you just got back from vacation I mean it's quite it's quite the recovery yes it was definitely an experience I would not recommend but you know I went there and I came back and now I enjoy life to the fullest extent so in some ways I will almost say that I'm glad it happened I don't think I'd be able to say that, but I'm glad you can say that. <laughs> well, thank you for talking to me. And then we will connect again after your book gets published. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.